Pantanidib and profenadone have both been shown to be effective at slowing the progression of, of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The mechanisms of action are different. Nintanidib was designed to inhibit three growth factors, vascular endothelial growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, and platelet-derived growth factor. And probably all three of those growth factors uh, uh, participate in driving the progression of IPF. So inhibiting them, we think, is responsible for the beneficial effects of nintenidib. It is possible that nintenidib uh, also inhibits some other growth factors, uh, and that would be a very interesting thing for further investigation. Profenidone was initially found from a screen for compounds to inhibit inflammation and was subsequently found to inhibit fibrosis in animal models. The mechanism of action was less clear. We know that it inhibits TGF-beta, a cytokine that's very involved in the progression of pulmonary fibrosis, and also acts to scavenge or absorb reactive oxygen species, which we also think participate. So interestingly, both of these drugs probably have multiple mechanisms through which they inhibit idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis progression. Currently, we think Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is driven by recurrent or non-resolving injury to the alveolar epithelium, followed by aberrant or over-exaggerated repair responses. And there have been a large number of molecular targets identified in basically two strategies to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The first would be to protect the alveolar epithelium from that recurrent or non-resolving injury. The second strategy would be to try and dampen the over-exuberant repair processes. So as far as protecting the epithelium, there are probably a large number of insults that injure the epithelium in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but they seem to injure the epithelium in several common ways, either by producing oxidative stress, the exaggerated production of reactive oxygen species above and beyond the lung's ability to detoxify those species, another type of stress called endoplasmic reticular stress, where there is an excess of proteins uh, coming into the cell's protein-making machinery that aren't able to be folded properly and may aggregate, um, at which is, uh, protein aggregates are very toxic to the cell, and a third uh, way that the cells can be injured through DNA damage. So there are mechanisms in terms of protecting the cell from each of these stresses or damages, protecting the cell from oxidative stress, protecting the cell from endoplasmic reticular stress, and protecting the cells from DNA damage that have all now uh, shown benefit in preclinical trials. So that, I think, uh, will be a very uh, productive strategy as far as bringing those to patients. The second major class of strategies are reducing or dampening the wound repair or wound healing responses that we think are over-exaggerated or over-exuberant in IPF. And there's a slew of these that all act in concert. There's activation of the innate and probably now also the adaptive immune system. There's increased vascular permeability leading to vascular leak. There's recruitment and accumulation of fibroblasts. There's differentiation into the effector cell of fibrosis, the myofibroblast, which increases uh, extracellular matrix production and then cross-links it. So in each of those steps now, we think there are a rich set of molecular targets uh, that can be addressed to dampen each or uh, several of these responses. Things to dampen uh, the uh, innate immune system activation that we think drives uh, fibrosis, things to potentially reduce vascular leak, things to reduce fibroblast recruitment uh, or accumulation, things to reduce fibroblast differentiation to myofibroblasts, and things to inhibit matrix cross-linking. Right now, there are very promising uh, targets being addressed by phase two and phase three trials that has hit essentially all of these steps of wound healing. There are uh, antibodies targeting cytokines that drive innate uh, immune system activation, IL-13 and or IL-4, uh, that are being addressed uh, uh, or inhibited by antibodies uh, that are in uh, later phase trials. 
There are multiple agents that target fibroblast accumulation and or differentiation into myofibroblasts, including uh, agents that inhibit the activation of TGF-beta, agents that inhibit another growth factor that we think drives fibroblast uh, differentiation uh, and maturations, uh, connective tissue growth factor, and uh, another uh, mediator that we think is very critical for fibroblast recruitment called lysophosphatidic acid. So all three of those are being addressed in later phase trials. And then uh, as far as matrix cross-linking, there is an antibody to one of the enzymes that we think is most relevant for matrix cross-linking, lysyl oxidase-like 2 or LOXL2, that is also being addressed by antibody uh, therapy in a later phase trial. There, I think, is a lot to be gained by looking at agents that have already been approved for other indications and whether they might also be effective for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. One that is about to be investigated is the antibiotic Bactrim. It's been shown that there are certain components of the microbiome, which uh, the lung microbiome, the uh, amount of uh, bacteria that normally or uh, live in our lungs, and actually some of which have beneficial effects. There have been two that have been identified uh, that seem to track with progression of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, both of which would be sensitive to the antibiotic Bactrim. So actually a trial is being uh, uh, designed and actually implemented now to try Bactrim uh, in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis patients. Another drug for other indications, dabigatrin, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor, which has been used as an anticoagulant, uh, has been shown by us and others to also be effective in uh, treating fibrosis in preclinical models. Although there was already a trial of an anticoagulant, a warfarin, in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis that was shown not to be effective, our preclinical data shows that actually dabigatrin may be quite effective in ways that warfarin wasn't. So there is another drug that we think may be able to be repurposed uh, or purposed uh, for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis from other indications. So I think that can also be a very productive way forward for us.